We are going to be uh, in the eighth chapter of Second Kings. Um, I don't intend to do it all, but um, so I'm, I'm wanting to go up to about the uh, 19th first. I'm going to, Lord willing, give a recap. So instead of saying all of that now, because I'm probably going to repeat it, I want to go ahead and pray, and we will go uh, into the eighth chapter of Second Kings. Thank you, Father, for another evening that you've um, given to us. Um, sometimes we take for granted just the, the many blessings that you bestow upon us in your mercy. Thank you for waking us up and giving us a chance to continue to grow in you and to be faithful to you. If we've fallen short, and um, I'm sure some of us have, and probably in areas that we didn't even realize that I ask that you forgive us. And help us to grow stronger as we continue to study your word, studying your word uh, as if consuming natural food, but a greater food that will uh, empower us, enable us in spirit to comply to your will and to fight against the wiles of the devil. Help us as we look at uh, things that have taken place in, in the past to take heart and to take courage and to be encouraged by it, but at the same time to see that there's really a warning for the entire world. There's a blessing in, in, in keeping your word and a cursing or a curse if we don't. We have various needs, um, especially in this, this earthly realm, physical needs. I ask that you help us. Infirmities, bones that are growing frail, minds sometimes that are uh, distracted or not as, as strong and, and quick as they used to be, uh, issues on the job, uh, issues with finances and just the cares of this world, but help us to have the right kind of heart so that when the seed is sown that it will fall on good ground and we don't hear it a none and say maybe, maybe perhaps it was a good message, but that we will take it to heart as the food that we need to be sustained. Before we end our prayer, Lord, you saw, you see the needs of many of our brothers and sisters in this body of Christ who need you in one way or another. I ask that you keep them strong and protect them. And if you should see fit to call them and or even us, uh, hopefully from glory to reward. Help us to understand that to you all men live. And I ask that you help me with this lesson to be clear and to actually live by the very message that we want to teach to the glory and edification, to your glory, to the edification of the body of Christ. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, as I've already said, we're going to be looking in the eighth chapter of Second Kings. Now, I'm looking at this. I want to go ahead and say up front, that even if we were to do all of this chapter, it's going to get to some parts where it is confusing. So uh, uh, my one of my goals is tonight, let me say it that way, is to uh, really try to s speak slowly and clearly. When I say clearly, not that I, I think I'm going to fumble a lot, even though sometimes my words don't come out as I want them to. But as far as concept, uh, our thought is concerned is what I want to do. Um, I'm going to give you my title at this at this point. Usually I like to speak a little bit and somewhere about after five to maybe eight minutes, I'll give a title, but I'm going to give a title right now. It's, my title is this, The Word of God in His Spirit of Truth Transcends Time. The Word of God in His Spirit or Its Spirit of Truth transcends time. I don't know how well you might even feel that I'm going to develop the thought, but I know what I've looked at and I prayed. I said, Lord, help me help me to kind of um, maybe consolidate what I'm wanting to kind of bring out in the title. And so this is what I have come up with. Last week, if we, if we go back just a little bit and, and, and think about that seventh chapter, it is crucial. And I'm going to even read a little bit more on that as I was looking at Josephus and he gave some 
some um, information that I think will help me transition or tie in into what we're going to be looking at tonight. Last week, when we were looking in the seventh chapter of Second Kings, we were looking at there was this attack from this from the Syrians. I'm going to try to keep it right. The Syrians on the upper kingdom or the northern kingdom of Palestine known as Israel. We want to remember, especially if you haven't been with us, that there was a divided kingdom of the people of God. The kingdom had split because of disobedience. Anyway, the Syrian nation was going to attack um, Israel. And basically, if you go back and listen, um, we've tried to help us to remember that God would often punish his people by way of a famine or famine and cause the people to really um, be in great uh necessity of food so that in their in their in, in their dire straits and in, in their in their severe dependence upon him and on the earth that he had given and the crops that he had given that was to be a blessing unto them go back and look in leviticus 26 chapters good all of it is good but read that if you if you need to he said, well, if I cause this famine on you, you'll understand that because of things that I have written before, you can understand. And in many cases, if I cause a famine to come to you, you've walked outside of my will and I'm judging you. And I'm, I'm, I'm often going to let another nation come in and rule over you. Something that was never supposed to happen to the people of God. Well, the Syrian nation was going to come in. And what had happened was, is that um, we're going to remember that Joram was the king of the northern kingdom. Joram was the king of the northern kingdom. We've we've talked about the king of the of the south or Judah. So far, we've looked at Jehoshaphat. We just haven't mentioned his name in quite a while. Well, Joram says, you know, this king of, of, of the north, he says, we're going to keep our people enclosed within the city walls, this great wall of protection so that the Syrians cannot penetrate and, and, and harm us. There would be a store of food that the people uh, of, of the north would rely on. Well, it got so, uh, so desperate for the people that um, they started eating dove's dung started eating the, the defiled food such as a, a donkey's head and there was no skin on it. And that was a curse and that was a sign to them that they had really walked outside of God's will. Well, there was this, the king of, 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 of um, let me get it right, of Israel. He was walking around the, the city wall. And uh, he he was looking to to make sure, according to Josephus, I'll just give you a little bit of it right now. According to Josephus, Joram was walking up against the city wall because he was wanting to make sure that there was no one who was going to um, commit treason against uh, against Israel and in giving information to the uh, Syrians. Now that's uh, I'm, I'm saying Josephus. I am not equating Josephus to the Bible, but we'll find that what a lot of the a lot of times when you look at his writings it corresponds with the scripture and it's historical and so we can get um some information that will help us understand some things well there was two women that talked to uh joram one of them screamed out and said uh, king oh king and he finds out what's wrong with her and there was the issue where these two women had determined that they would eat their sons to survive and one woman didn't comply with the agreement Jehoram is upset about this and he curses Elisha. So mention the prophet Elisha. And uh, it looks like he's mad at Elisha because this must be Elisha's fault. He's the man of God. Again, I'm going to refer to Josephus. Um, according to what Josephus believes, he, he believes that it is possible that uh, Jehoram was upset with Elisha because Elisha should have prayed that God would end it. Well. We find that he didn't. So anyway, Jehoram sends uh, a servant to e Elisha because he wants Elisha's head decapitated. He wants to kill. He wants to punish the man of God. Elisha's in, a, a, let's say, in, an enclosure or a room somewhere with some disciples, some men that, let's say, the sons of the prophets. And he's talking and he uh, he he understands that this servant is coming to kill him. And he says, look at this servant, uh, a servant of a murderer calling Jehoram a murderer. Well, when I was looking again and trying to prepare for the night, I said, let me go look. At, I, I don't know why I didn't look last week, um, but I, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, 
according to Josephus, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I want to share it with you, okay? According to the text that Josephus has recorded, it said that um, Je, uh, Jehoram might have repented. And so that while in the King James, you see where Elijah says the feet of the king or the murderers coming after him, it looks like possibly that um, Jehoram sent his servant and then later on he went following him and thinking that maybe the servant was going to actually decapitate uh, uh, Elisha's, Elisha's head. And so he's going to uh, stop him from doing that. Well, whether that's true or not, we understand that the king was there because the Bible said the, the servant who's the king leaned upon. Say, like, Gary, you're confusing me. Let me, let me, I want to keep it all together because we're not really covering that many scriptures tonight. Elijah wants to kill. I'm, I'm sorry. Jehoram wants to kill Elijah. He sends a servant to do it. But then he later on follows the servant. E Elijah's talking to some men. He tells his men, don't let him in. Well, um, Elijah says that basically that this famine is not going to last long. This famine is not going to last long. And the man that uh, Jehoram sent, he doesn't believe it. And he says, even if God could open up the windows of heaven, could he even, I mean, it is so bad. Could he even basically provide food for this, I mean, provide food for us? Elisha says, uh, yes. And he, and he talks about how the condition is going to change and how food would be sold at a cheaper price. You can go back and you can, you can read this. But he tells this servant of Jehoram who was sent to kill him, he says, but you won't see it. And so when we look at the rest of that uh, uh, portion where we we're looking on last week, we see that four lepers are mentioned, right? Because remember, there's still a siege where the Syrians want to attack the, the, uh, the Israelites or the upper kingdom. These four lepers are sitting outside the gate and they say, basically, our condition is poor. If we go in, we can't go inside the city. If we go in there, we could die. There's no food. If we sit here outside the city, we could die. There's no food. But this Syrian army, they're, they're, they're besieging us. They've surrounded us. What if we turn ourselves into to them? They could kill us or they might have mercy on us. So they go to the Syrian camp that has surrounded the city, the walled city. And they find that the Syrians have vacated their siege. Now, what I tried to bring up last week is that we see that um, when we were, uh, uh, if, if you would uh, mute your, uh, your, the volume, that would, that would just be so wonderful for me. We see that before when uh, this, uh, the people, the, the Syrians wanted to raid, uh, how can I say, the Israelites. Elijah had prayed at one point that God will open his servant's eyes who was scared. I believe that's in the sixth chapter. Go back and read it. I promise it's, it's so good. And we see that there was a, a an army, an angelic or a spiritual army that was there that the natural eye could not see. But because Elisha prayed that God would open his servant's eyes, he saw the chariots and the horses of fire. And he was like, oh, now that's in chapter six, if I'm not mistaken. When we get to chapter seven, remember that I've said the Syrians have vacated. Uh, they are, are uh, cease from their siege. When those four lepers go there, the Bible tells us that the Syrian army, it was as if they heard chariots and horses coming and, and, their, and their king or their general or however you want to say it, thought that the Egyptians had come and, and one of the other armies, one from the north and one from the south, I can't remember if it was the, the Philistines or whoever, but it was another army, Ethiopians maybe, I forgot. And so they had left and they left food. They left all of this gold and silver. And those lepers like, oh, my goodness, we sitting well now. We were as good as dead. But look at all we got. And so they started hiding stuff. And they started, you know, hiding some gold and silver and some garments. And they, they started eating. And then their heart smote them. And it's like, you know what? If we don't share this with King Jehoram, remember King Jehoram, still the king of the north. He said, something's, something's bad is going to happen. So they go back and they go to the wall and they start screaming out to tell uh, Jehoram. Jehoram, it seems, doesn't believe it. And uh, so anyway, uh, one of Jehoram's servants, he says, you know what? We need to send some, some men out there and go check it out. They finally check it out. 
and they find out that it is as those lepers have said. Now, there's more, a little bit more to it, but I, I, I want to move in to where we are tonight. So hopefully that is kind of catching us up to where we were, where we want to be tonight. So I'm going to hit my title again, and we're going to start with uh, the verses for this evening. My title again is The Word of God in its and His Spirit of Truth Transcends Time. The Word of God in His Spirit of Truth Transcends Time. So what happens? Um, the man who did not believe uh, what Elisha said, Elisha had told him, he said, you won't live basically to see it. That man, uh, once, uh, how can I say, Jehoram, finds out that it's true that the, that the Syrians had vacated and left the siege. He finally, all of the people from within inside the gate the, the, uh, Israel, the, of, of Israel, they rush to uh, outside the wall because they want to eat. And the very man that Elijah prophesied to, you won't see it, he's trampled by the Israelites going in to get food. He died. So we're picking up now, I want to say at this seventh verse, so we'll try to connect this. Hopefully you didn't feel that the uh, summary was too long. Tree, if you want to kind of go back even maybe a verse prior to the to the seventh verse of the eighth chapter, you can. But I, I want to uh, to pick up, I believe, right there. Seven? Yeah. Chapter, eight. Uh, chapter, let's see. No, I'm sorry. I'm 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 thinking of two chapters at the same time. So I, what I want to do now is we're going to pick up at verse seven of chapter eight. But before she does that, I I want to just kind of reiterate something. Thank thank you for saying that because again, I'm, I'm I guess I'm kind of conflating two chapters. I've already taught actually verses one through six of chapter eight. So again, I, I, I'm going to get very, very brief synopsis of what happened there. I think I taught that, I want to say somewhere after maybe chapter, I can't remember if it was chapter four or five. There was a Shunammite woman that Elijah had blessed. The Shunammite woman uh, was told by Elijah that she would have a son. The son eventually dies and Elijah goes back and he heals that son. The Shunammite woman did not want to listen. I know it's a lot of names. Uh, but hopefully you can remember. If not, go back and reread the scripture. Elisha had a servant by the name of Gehazi. Gehazi was selfish. Gehazi was the same one who tried to deceive, or well, did deceive Naaman and, and, and um, was struck with leprosy. Well, the Shunammite woman comes back on the scene. This is after Elisha healed her son. Because of this famine uh, was was so great, Elisha had told her, he said, you need to get out or away from uh, your country and you need to go away for seven years. Basically, God is punishing this particular uh, nation. So she goes away and she comes back and she finds that her land has been, uh, how can I say, uh, occupied. I want to say apportioned. I don't even know if that is a word. Her land is her, her land has been occupied by other people because she's been gone for seven years. But we see that um, Gehazi is talking to uh, King Jehoram. Jehoram wants to know about the, the, the miracles and the great things that God has uh, caused Elisha to do. Now, when I taught this, it's probably been at least a month, maybe a little longer. Uh, I said that many of the commentaries that uh, I looked at felt that this first six verses should have been appended to or attached to, I think it's chapter five, where um, where we read about the Shunammite woman. If it's not, then you can read and logically figure out what I'm talking about. Well, whether that's true or not, what we find is that God, through Elisha and all his great works, that a, that Gehazi was able to see, it still stands strong. Jehoram learns of the thing that Elijah had done, and he restores this land to this woman. I think it's beautiful. So one other thing, or maybe two, before we start with verse 7. Concerning Gehazi, if this is not, um, I'm gonna, if this is not chronological, then it may, perhaps should be right next to where, where I taught, I think, again in chapter 5. If it's where it should be, some people feel that perhaps Gehazi repented and no longer had leprosy. I can't tell you for certain if that's true or not. That is conjecture. 
Because what's what? Why am I even saying that? How is it that Gehazi could be in the presence of the king and talk to him now? So that's that's just something that you you might want to look at. What I can say is Gehazi testified of the goodness of God and His power through what Elijah was doing and His faithfulness. And this woman was blessed because she followed the man of God's word. Now, after about ten or 15 minutes or so, we go to verse 7. I want to go through about verse 18. And then at, when we get around that part, we're going to turn to Second Chronicles, the 22nd chapter, and look at a few verses. This is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's very important that we stay in it and understand as, as much as we can. Drip, you'll pick up at the 7th verse and read uh, down through about the 18th verse. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go. Meet the man of God, and inquire of Yahweh by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit Yahweh has showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepest, my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, Yahweh has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou should surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth, and dipped it in water, and spread it on his face, so that he died, and Hazael reigned in his stead. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of Yahweh. Thank you. So my wife just read from verse 7 of chapter 8 through 18 of Second Kings. Up until this point, most of what I said has been uh, sort of a, a synopsis, a summary of where we have been. I am still going to be trying to connect this to the past because there are some names that are going to be important. And I think it, it's indicative of some deeper things that have taken place. Now, once you picked up with this seventh verse, I want to read a little something uh, after I read the verse again from Josephus. OK, a little historical context. Listen at this. Um, now, all of this, uh, if, if we were to, let's say, take the part out about the Shunammite woman where she receives her land again. We would see that this falls after, uh, contextually anyway, after this siege of the Syrians and how they fled. Okay, so when the Syrians fled, remember that because of the famine, the people inside the gate of Israel, they rushed to go partake and benefit from the booty of the spoil of the food that the Syrians left behind. Does that make sense? So I'm going to read the seventh verse and then I want to read a little excerpt from um, Josephus because I think it may give us some insights of something that actually may have been. Listen at the seventh verse, okay? And Elijah came to Damascus, OK? 
Okay, this is the the, the capital of the northern uh, kingdom, Israel. And Ben Hadad, king of Syria, was sick, and it was told Ben Hadad, saying, "The man of God has come hither." Listen to what Ben Hadad wants. And Ben Hadad the king said unto Hazael, "Take a present in thine hand and go and meet the man of God. Go meet Elisha." And inquire of Elisha of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? This to me is this is interesting. This, this calm down, Gary. This is interesting to me. Here's an enemy nation who at one point, actually many points, because we you go back to first king, just many points the Syrians were were in, in battle or conflict with the people of God. Yet. Ben Hadad the second is sick. Ben Hadad is the one who had his men out there uh, uh, trying to besiege Israel, but he need he wants he wants counsel <laughs> from the man of God. There's so much right there. I, 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 I might come back to it. This man has sent a servant to Elisha to understand what his condition will be. Does that make you think of Daniel in the Bible? When uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar, he had problems, but then he sought for Daniel. Does it make you think of Joseph when the Pharaoh had put him in prison and the, and the Pharaoh had a dream, but he sought for the man of God? The scripture, the scripture is a scripture supports that many times the individual, the child, the man, the woman, the servant of God might be in some kind of situation, but... If that individual holds on to God's truth and is faithful, even the oppressor will still understand that God is mighty and that that particular individual has truth, the truth of God. You hear what I said? If you don't hear it, I, I, I'm going to hear it. I got to hear it. I got to hear it. Now, I said I wanted to read something from Josephus, and we're going to come back to this beautiful text right here. And just because I might get excited, somebody told me one time, he said, Gary, you, 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 you show too much pathos. I didn't even know what the person was talking about. So I went and looked the word up. Too much emotion. I said, Psh. right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm teaching. And if that's the way it comes out, that's the way it comes out. This is God's word. I want to read something from Josephus, and hopefully this will make sense. Um, based on our, remember, taking into account the siege that had took place. According to Josephus, he feels that possibly Ben-Hadad grew fearful and that he thought that God was actually dealing with him. So I want to read this right here. This is coming from uh Josephus, the Antiquities of the Jews, book nine. I'm looking at where it says six. Anyway, listen to this. Hereupon, when Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, had escaped to Damascus and understood that it was God himself that cast all his army into this fear and disorder, that he did not arise from the invasion of his, uh, that he, let me start over, that he, and that it did not arise from the invasion of his enemies, he was mightily cast down at his having God so greatly for his enemy and fell into distemper. Now, this is, I guess you could say, in our modern day parlance, or at least the way it's translated, distemper. What is distemper? Disarray. I looked at something that mean it could have been like uh, mental, uh, mental incapacity, madness. I looked at something where it could be a physical, a physical uh, incapacity or, or sickness or something. So I don't know if it was strictly physical. I don't know if it was both physical and mental. But I believe that what Josephus is saying is that this king, Ben-Hadad, in all his little bitty power, was understanding that God's hand was upon him. Now, let's, let's look at something else. Before I finish another sentence or two out of Josephus, we talked about when we looked in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and just the word of God. How God would say, I will bring an enemy in against you to deal with you, to judge you, to be my sword. If, if the people of God are disobedient, however, there would be a certain point that God would want them to go to. So even when a person's heart is against God, he can continue to use that person, but then he's going to deal with them because God is the God of all of heaven and he wants harmony in the, in the land. Yes, he does. I'm going back to where I was. Listen to what this 
this is Ben Haddad. I'm still I'm still in Josephus, and we're going to return to the scripture. This is a this is a Ben Haddad. He was mightily cast down at his having God so greatly for his enemy, and and tell, uh, and fell into his distemper. Now it happened that Elisha the prophet at that time was going out of his own country to Damascus, of which Ben Haddad was informed. He sent Haziel, the most faithful of his servants, to meet him. Now that's where I want to stop because we pick up in the scripture right here. Now, when I read that in Josephus about Haziel being uh, his most faithful servant, I thought about the man who died at the gate. I don't know if the man who died at the gate was um, his most faithful servant before Hazael, or if they were both good, or if Hazael was superseded uh, faithfulness to Ben Haddad. Let me. What What are you saying, Gary? You just confused me. Um, Josephus said Hazael was Ben Haddad's most faithful servant, but I remember reading that Hazael leaned on that man when he went to to. Uh, to Elisha. So I, I, I was just curious. It was just me thinking. Now, I want to share something else that I read from Josephus, and we're going to return to the scripture, unless you feel like I'm leaving the scripture too much. Remember that in, in the beginning portion, uh, when I was trying to give, in, give the summary, I said, uh, according to Josephus, he feels that, um, let's see, Jehoram, king of Israel, perhaps was repenting and so while he sent his servant to behead Elisha, he went after him. And so I I, I, I want to read it, but I'm not I'm just going to tell you. So if that is true, according to Josephus, when Elisha told them that tomorrow you'll be able to get food at a cheaper price, according to Josephus' account, um, Jehoram and the other people of the Israelites grew happy. But that's when the servant said, if God can open up the windows of heaven. So in other words, if that's correct, it looks like everybody else was happy, but the servant. So the servant ended up dying. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's you see how it just seems to line up with the scripture. So let's go back to the scripture. Where are we? Ben Haddad knows that the man of God is there and he wants some godly counsel. He wants the truth. My title again is the word of God and his spirit of truth transcends time. So can you, can you get, can you get a, I don't want to say it like this. It sounds like word of faith. I don't believe in word of faith. Name it, claim it. No, I believe in God can heal you if he wants to. Let me go back. He wants some godly counsel. Um, probably not the liver. He wants to be healed. Basically, let me put it that way. He wants to be healed. So he sends this servant, Hazael. Now, we're going to, Dre, I want you to, if you would, turn to 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. We're going to read two verses from there, but not just yet. 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. We're going to look at verse 15 through about 16. That's going to take us back a little bit in, in time. But So I'm going back to where we are here. Listen at it. I'm at verse 7 again in 2 Kings, 8 chapter. If you're wondering where I asked my wife to turn, I asked her to turn to 1 Kings 19 verse 15. Where are we in, in, in the eighth chapter? And Elisha came to Damascus and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him saying, the man of God is come hither. And the king, this is Ben-Hadad, said to Haziah, his most faithful servant, according to Josephus, Josephus, take a present in thine hand and go and meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him saying, I'm scared. Shall I recover of this disease? Now, Maybe he was it's like God's hand is upon me. Now, what I read is that he, uh, according to Josephus again, is that uh, these these donkeys took fruit, the choicest kind, and different things that would be uh, most worthy of the king's palace from Syria. And you see that he take a, take a gift to him. Now, let's read a little bit further. Now I'm going. You might say finally to verse nine of Second Kings eight chapter. So Hazael went to meet him. Hazael is like going to meet Elisha. And he took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camels burden. Can you imagine? Be, those cam, camels can carry a lot. And they came and stood before Elisha and said, thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Basically, we have a reiteration of what the king had told him to say. Now, this thy son was a way of being 
Ambar, showing humility, whether it was sincere or not. I believe it was sincere, at least enough to the point that he knew that he could probably die. He was worried enough to send someone there. Can I say something? I said it was very interesting to me how this enemy who wanted to conquer and defeat God's people sent to the man of God. Does it not seem familiar when Naaman was sent? Doesn't it seem familiar when the letter was sent to Elijah or to, to, to um, uh, Jehoram about Naaman? Lord, have mercy again, again, again. We have to be faithful because we, if we're going to be the light, a city that's set on the hill, there will be people who want to come against us. But when history happens, when situations happen, Lord, have mercy, they ought to know there is someone who is faithful to God and who has not gone the way of the world, who will hold to truth that transcends time. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to God but by me. I would ask the question, what is truth? But he had put up there on, I think, in Hebrew, Aramaic, and in Jewish. If I got that, if I got that wrong, you know what I mean? King, the king of the Jews. And it was true. It was true. Well, he's uh, standing before Elisha. And I, I, I. I wonder, I'd love to know the impact of this presence. Because you could, it seems like Elijah has a great vision to see things from afar off. Remember that Shunammite woman? He saw, he said, uh, Gehaz, I go, look, she's coming. Go see if all is well with her son or child. Gary, you keep making other references. It could be that Elisha saw him coming and he remembered some things that God had said. Listen at what. Elisha says, I haven't forgotten, Drake, that I asked you to go to the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. This is the 10th verse. As Hezio is um, finishing up this, this reason why he's there, Elijah responds. This is the 10th verse. And Elijah said unto him, Go and say unto Ben-Hadad, your king, Thou mayest certainly recover. But, however, the Lord has shown me that he shall surely die. You're going to die. Now, one of the commentaries I was reading is like, um, did Elijah lie? I guess you could look at that several ways, but I, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think he lied. Now, listen at this. And he settled his count. I want to come back to verse eleven. Now, the word of God in His Spirit of Truth transcends time. Now, we're going to look at just a couple of verses here in First uh, Kings nineteen. If you and I can remember that Elisha was a great prophet. But he had one to teach him as Elijah was outside working in the fields with, I think, uh, his oxen and so forth. When Elijah, Elijah uh, came and basically he, he, he gave him a message from the Lord. He was going to take up the, can I say, the mission, the call, because Elijah was going to be uh, taken into heaven by the whirlwind. Well, before this, uh, Elijah had had issues and issues is really not uh, an accurate description he had problems with uh, Jezebel and with Ahab and so God was dealing with him remember when he went and hid I, I want to say he was in a cave and the Bible talked about how God shook the earth and there was fire and so forth but then it said God spoke to him in a small voice so if you go back and you look at that this is where God tells Elijah some things he's given him truth he's given him the ability to have some foresight into the future elijah is not going to be the one who fulfills this but his his um how can i say uh, his his disciple elisha will Drew, if you'll read 15 i guess it's 15 16 and 17 from first kings 19 and yahweh said unto him go return on thy way to the wilderness of damascus and when thou comest anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. That's this, this good. She reversed 15, 16, and 17. Now, right now, 
where in the 19th chapter of first kings she read verses 15 through 18. I, I, I must needs comment a little bit about that before we return to the 8th chapter of 2 Kings. Can I do that, please? So Elijah, according to the scripture that we see there, it looks like it was Elijah's job to do the anointing. I think the first name that we have from the 15th verse, listen at it again. This is 1 Kings chapter uh, 19. And the Lord said unto him, go and return on thy way uh, to the wilderness. Remember, Elijah, had, he, he was like, this is too much for me. He had gotten away. Uh, he said, return to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael. Now, at the time when the when God is telling him to anoint Hazael, who was the king? Ben-Hadad was the king. We see that the spirit of truth, first of all, is telling Elijah, uh, Ben-Hadad is not going to reign. He's not going to reign anymore. Hazael is going to become king. You anoint him. And then he goes on and tells him to anoint uh, uh, um, Elisha. Well, very interesting here. If we were to really, I don't think, maybe it's, 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 it's kind of obvious, but sometimes it's not when we read with our Western mind so far removed. We get a little bit of the punishment. I don't want to say the judgment. I like judgment. The judgment of God to his people when he says, he that escapes, those that think they're going to escape, Hazael, Jehu's going to get. Those that think they're going to escape Jehu, Elisha's going to get. In other words, God's going to deal with you all because of your hard-heartedness, your stiff-neck, stiff-neckedness. That's a word. Your rebellion and your disobedience. I want people that will be faithful to me. You don't just come up here with a ceremony. You don't just come up in here with a uh, 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 oxen. You don't just come up in here with a lamb. You don't just come up in here saying that because you come to the tabernacle or the temple, I should say. That you, my people, I expect you to be faithful to me. One God, Israel, there is one God. Don't you start worshiping all these other doctrines, these other demons. Don't you do it. I am truth. I'm the one that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I'm the one that parted the Red Sea. I'm the one that raised up those judges for you in, 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 in the time of the judges. I am. I am not Jemos, not Asherim, not Molech, not 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 Dagon. I am. I am. I am Moses. You tell them I am. Word of God. His spirit of truth transcends time. So we see that God had told Elijah what was going to be. So we know that Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind and his mantle fell on Elisha. When we are looking in this eighth chapter of Second Kings. What is happening? God's word is coming to fruition. In other words, it's, it's happening. How much time does God need? How much time do we try? How do we try to restrict God in his time? Listen. First Peter. First Peter, I think it's, uh, let me think for a second. Second Peter. I think it's two and nine. We're not going to go there. If I'm wrong, it's in the third chapter, but I'm, uh, it might be the third chapter. It says something like this, and I, I want to make it clear because it'll seem like I'm just going totally out of the way. It speaks of how God regards time, and it speaks that God does not look at time like man. It says that one day is as a thousand years, as one thousand years is as one day. It is not saying, it's not specifying or, 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 or sticking, or, it's not emphasizing the one thousand. It's saying that to God, he's not bound by time. Let's go back to where we are. So anyway, time is past is my point. And God is bringing his prophecy or his, his word that he told Elijah to happen. But we see he's using Elisha. So here is this Hazael. And we're going to see that Hazael is going to take this message back from Elijah to King Ben-Hadad. Elijah says, yes, you're going to recover. Now, when we look at this, we're, we're almost where I want to be finished, okay? You know, you say, well, maybe that's so wonderful. Well, it, I don't know. I think it's wonderful. I don't know how you feel about it. That's what I mean. So Elijah says unto him, I'm back at the 10th verse, go and say to him, that is Ben-Hadad, thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord has shown me that he shall surely die. 11th verse, and he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. This scripture, I, I can't bring the heaviness to it. I would, 
I'll be honest with you, the first few times that I ever read this, it wasn't like in the last few weeks. I didn't really get it. But with commentary and, and so forth, I'm like, whoa. Okay. Elisha's saying what's, what's, what God has said. And remember where I, I mentioned where we looked in the 19th chapter? He who escapes, talking about God's judgment on his people, he who escapes the enemy, that's Hazael's sword, Jehu's going to get. Jehu's going to, he's going to be wicked too. He's going to work, he's going to do what God says, but he's going to turn away. If I remember, he's going to be wicked too. He who escapes Jehu is going to be dealt with by Elisha. So we see where there's going to be two people in the future that God used, but then he's going to use his men servant Elisha to exact punishment and judgment. Elisha looks at Hazael. I want to read in a different version. Uh, uh, this is from the New International Version, and it might not be the best. But listen, it's, it's what I have before me. It says in 11 verse, he, and he, he stared at him with a fixed gaze until Hezekiah fell ashamed. Then the man of God began to weep. Hezekiah, I don't know. It's like, well, maybe he's like, why, why are you looking at me like that? It kind of reminded me of when Jesus turned and looked at Peter after the cock crowed twice, but I don't believe it's going to be the exact equivalent, but I know the spirit of truth. And, uh, Jesus is truth, was truth. God is is truth was truth and the spirit of god reproves the world of sin is true <laughs> was truth 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 together truth so here is elijah telling this man this and i believe that god has showed elijah this man just like i said i didn't like gehazi i said gehazi looked selfish i believe that this is, this is this is conjecture here we are going to be seeing how still other nations had problems with the people of god or the soul called people of God Israel. We've talked about Moab. We've talked about Ammon. We've talked about the Edomites. We're going to see the Edomites hopefully next week when we see the Edomites still giving problems to God's people. And it could be that this Hezael, I don't know, maybe he wanted, he had in his heart was devising a, a coup or, or some way to overtake Hezael. I mean, not Hezael, but uh, 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 Ben-Hadad. Maybe he's just waiting on his opportunity because I'm like, why this stare? Maybe, maybe not. But Elijah's looking at this man, and then he begins to weep. Maybe, may, maybe this Hazael feels like Ben Hadad is so weak. What do you mean letting the army go? We're supposed to be back over there fighting, 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 taking over these people. Why we run away from them? I don't know. But when we read what happens next, Hazael he asks, he says, "Lord." It's showing this humbleness and respect to the man of God. Why are you weeping? What does Elijah say? Elijah answers this because I know the evil that, that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds, their fortified cities, what you said of are you gonna God is gonna allow you to, to deal with his people, his hard hearted people. You're gonna set those fortified cities on fire. You're going to destroy the strongest men with the sword. This is God's punishment. And then he says, you're going to dash their children. You're going to rip. You're going to, you will have no mercy on the pregnant women. You will destroy the armies. You're going to burn the cities. This was never supposed to happen. So when I see this and I tell you as like I'm anointing you, there's a grave, grave danger coming upon the people of God. And you're a wicked man. Hmm. Has the spirit of truth ever dealt with us, showing us ourselves? Well, let's continue on. 13th verse. And Hazael said, But well, what is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? Who do you think I am now? Again, I, I gave some conjecture, like maybe he would, had planned a coup, but I, I, I can't tell you that for sure. Because you look at you look at Judah, Judah. I'm 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 jumping up to to, to time in the scripture. The Judah, the Bible would say that Judah was the one that kept the purse, and you would see that he would do certain things with it. But then, when they when they would uh, when they were communing together, said that the, I think then Satan entered into Judah. Am I remembering that? Judas. Judas. I said Judah. I meant Judas. It's sort of yes, Judas. And Judas says that was y'all going to do. Go ahead and do it quickly. So it looked like in that account, it needed something else. It could be the same here. I, but I, I, I believe that, um, as my son would say, dude had some things cooking in his mind. 
thing. The dog was an animal that was despicable because often it would eat off of like uh, uh, what we, we might call roadkill. Some people call carrion, the putrid, or they would eat their own vomit, you know, things like that. So a dog wasn't like what we would think of. So, you think I'm a dog? I'm so worthless. I'm so vile. Elijah answered and said, the Lord has shown me that thou shalt be king of Assyria. <laughs> he got an answer, didn't he? But if, if according to this, is like he didn't say you're going to necessarily be that, but he said, the Lord has shown me you're going to be king. So one of the things that I was looking at said, it looks like this might have given uh, Hezael the occasion to do what he's about to do. Look what happens with Hezael. This is the 14th verse. Let me see what time it is. Oh, wow. Time keeps slipping, slipping into the future. 14th verse. So he departed from Elijah and came to his master who said unto him, this is Ben-Hadad. What saith Elijah unto thee? And he answered, he told me that thou shouldest surely recover. Imagine Ben-Hadad's heart. Oh God, I thought God was against me, but the man of God has said that I'm going to recover. Naaman, Naaman was healed. Can I add a little something? Maybe I can go stand on that dirt that Naaman brought back. I don't know. I don't even know how old Naaman was at this particular point. I imagine he was joyous, but it came to pass the next day on the morrow that he, that is Hezael, took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it upon Ben-Hadad's face so that he died and Hezael reigned in his stead. Well, it's like, well, did it come to pass? Now, one of the things I read said they believed that um, Ben-Hadad was recovered. Now, sometimes what you'll see in the scriptures, God will say something will come to pass, but because man, he, doesn't, he doesn't make man to be, uh, what they say, predestined like a robot. He, God knows the heart of man and he knows what man, man will do, but he could have been healed. What am I talking about what God will, he knows. If you look in 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter concerning Kaliah, David asked God, shall I go? Will the man of God, will the man of Kaliah deliver? Kaliah delivered me over to the Philistine. God says, yes. So David, once he learns what God says, David determines, determines to, to uh, go a different way. And what God said would happen uh, didn't happen because God gave David free will. So I think it's in 1 Kings. Uh, I said 1 Kings. I think 1 Samuel 23. So I, I hope I'm correcting myself right. 1 Samuel 23. Hezael goes and he smothers and he kills. Ben it, it, am, am I being clear? I hope I'm being clear. We're almost finished because I said to verse 19 tonight. Drew, I want you to turn to Second uh, Chronicles 22nd chapter. I'm wanting to read about three verses because after that, it's going to be very much the same or very similar to where, where I'm about to end up here. So Ben-Hadad uh, is now, he's murdered. Now, uh, according to the account in Josephus, if you if, if you were to read where I was and, and keep reading several pages, you'll see that the Syrians would later on. And, and I'm just just giving you this. This is a so you would know if you if you're inclined to care. Both Ben Haddad and um, Hazael would be worshipped later on in guys in the Syrian culture, which means that there would be a positive uh, perspective on their reign. So some believe, and I think this I think this is plausible, that Ben Hadad uh was killed um unbeknownst to the other people by Hazael. Let me say it again. Hazael probably killed Ben Hadad in secret. And so if the people knew that Ben Hadad was sick, they might not know that uh or if if if, the, if there were people who knew it's probably a small, small circle that Hazael had killed them. So in other words, if they were both later be deceased, they would regard them highly and count them as gods. Anyway, so let's Let's finish up this particular part right here, and then I'm going to ask you to read about three or four verses from Second Chronicles 22. So, Ben Hadad is killed, and now we're going to learn. This is where it's going to get a little confusing. Um, listen at this. And in the fifth year of Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being the king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. What? <laughs> <laughs> this might be where I needed to stop, uh, but I'm not. 32 uh, years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. I'm going to stop right there and explain a little bit, and then I'm going to ask Trey to go to read those verses of Chronicles. All right. Please hear me for these last few minutes, maybe five or so. Uh, Ben-Hadad is now dead. Hazel is reigning in the enemy camp uh, of the nation of Syria. So we've had, okay, so I'm going back now. Who was the king that was married to Jezebel? His name was Ahab. 
If you look in um, the last chapter of 1 Kings and the first chapter of 2 Kings, you'll see Ahab's son Ahaziah reigned and he was wicked. Okay. Ahaziah later dies. He, he falls. Uh, uh, he falls and then he doesn't recover. He, he's, he's still um, he dies from that sickness or the, the being lame or whatever. Always involved with that. Joram, another son of Ahab, begins to reign and he's wicked. Okay. Now, if you all can remember, Jehoshaphat had uh, made an alliance with Ahab on one account, and then Jehoshaphat was going to make an alliance with Ahaziah on one account with some ships, and, and Jehu rebukes him and so forth. And so we'll see that Jehoshaphat had an affinity with the kings of Israel, even though he did some good things. He would make relationships and build relationships that should not have been. Why am I saying this? Jehoshaphat would have many sons. And he named one of his sons Jehoram. Okay, what? There's a king in the northern kingdom named Jehoram who is of the wicked Ahab. His name is Jehoram. Jehoshaphat in the south decides, well, I'm going to name one of my sons Jehoram. Ah, this is showing some allegiance. Names meant something back then. Guess what? Ahab had a daughter named Athaliah. Jehoshaphat lets his son Jehoram marry Athaliah. Let me, I'm going to repeat it just a little bit more. And I'm going to get you to read these verses. Jehoshaphat, who was of the south, Named one of his kings after Ahab's son, who was wicked. So there's two Jehorams now, or Jorams. There's a Jehoram in the in the north who's wicked. There's now a Jehoram in the south who's going to become king as Jehoshaphat dies. Jehoram of Judah is going to marry Ahab's daughter, one of Ahab's daughters, who's wicked because her mother was Jezebel. Okay, so that's where we. Left off at verse 18. So we're going to turn to Second Chronicles chapter 22 and read a few verses. And Lord willing, we're going to pick back up uh, next Tuesday. And we're going to try to move on with this. Dre, I'd like you to read down through about verse uh, verse 4 or 5. And we're in we're in Second Chronicles, 22nd chapter. Please read. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his stead. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the elders. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. For his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. Wherefore he did evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. He walked also after their counsel and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Hazael, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. Okay. And smote Jorah. And the Syrian smote Jorah. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna. That's that's the stopping point where we'll read. But I, I do want to just come in a little bit on this. This is pretty much, this is where we're gonna be, gonna be going into this. Now, there's actually even another name that's mentioned here. Okay, two Jorams, one in the north, one in the south. Both of them are wicked. Jehoshaphat's son Jor, Joram or Jehoram marries Athaliah. Athaliah is sort of like or very much like Jezebel. Joram of the south and Athaliah have a son named Ahaziah. King Ahab had also a son named Ahaziah. There is all this naming, giving allegiance to people who've been wicked. There's, there's, there's an affinity there. Judah, remember, this is, the, this is where the scepter would not depart out of the kingdom of Judah. Satan was fighting against God's will. He knew what was said about Judah and about the lion of Judah. He didn't want the truth of God's word to take place. He fights through people. He, there's principalities and things. You see it in this, this, this government here. Well, what did we see here? Joram, it's it's a jump, but Lord willing, we'll treat some of this on next week. 
Joram of the south, who's Jehoshaphat's son, and Athaliah, uh, ah Ahab's daughter. They have a son who's wicked as well. And um, I'm just going to say they 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 rule wickedly. And I I I I think I want to just stop right there. If you don't like the abrupt stop, I I'll ask that you pardon. But Lord willing, we're going to be diving into this. So let me give just a little recap of where we've been tonight. Tonight we've seen that where God told Elijah to anoint Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha because Haziel was going to be king in Syria. We've seen it take place now. Elisha followed in the footsteps of God and he was walking faithfully as Elijah did. We see that uh, that this um, that the truth of what God has said it it came to be. And we see that um, even looking at that Shunammite woman, because she um, paid attention to God's word, she was blessed. We are looking at kings who would not adhere to God's word. And we see the judgment of God on them through famine. We see the judgment of God on them through the Syrians. We're just going to see how God continues to deal with the people who are supposed to be called by his name. Well, he said, we didn't end on a positive note tonight. Yes, we did. We The positive note is, is that God has left his instruction for us to learn. And so that we, through patience and comfort of the scripture, can have hope. And we can have comfort of the scripture that when God says, if you walk against me, I will deal with you as a father should deal with his child that he loves. But if you continue to walk away, I'll let you go. I'll let you go into your own damnation because I've told you from the beginning what it's going to be like. I told you from the beginning. So, uh, again, the title that I had of the word of God and his spirit of truth transcends time it transcends the time from when we looked in leviticus it transcended the time from when moses said when you get over there this is what it's going to be like it transcended the time of what god told elijah to elisha and it's going to transcend time all throughout the scripture god doesn't change and all men will be liars but god's word will be true heavenly father we thank you for giving us a chance to go through a portion of your scripture I'm asking that you help us to be mindful of how you say you want us to live and to be faithful to you. Help us, dear Lord, that even in times where we might be in conflict against someone who doesn't love you and therefore despises us, that we can be faithful so that they know that truth is exemplified in us and will understand that they really need to come to us to get the sustenance of how to view life and how to live. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to open up for discussion. Hopefully it wasn't too confusing, but when we first started, and I think this second king, I said, it's going to it's going to come to a point where it's going to be a little confusing. So uh, I'll stop at least for a little bit and see if there are any thoughts, questions or insight on what we talked about on this evening. It was dense, so you might not even. Have anything to say or know where to start, but um, <laughs> uh, we're still open for discussion. I just have one question. Okay. Did you hear me at all? Uh, yes, sir. I hear you now. I think Dre was talking. I can be quiet. Go ahead, Dre. I, I just want to get my question down and tell me you might even be able to help out with it. But the question that I have was when you went back to chapter. I guess it was 19 mm-hmm. um, of Second King. First, uh, Kings. First King, chapter 19, and you talked about how Elijah mm-hmm. anointed Elisha as his successor. Mm-hmm. He anointed he anointed Hazael king over is uh, over Syria. Well, Elijah didn't. This is where God was giving the instruction to do it. But uh, in the second, I want to say it's the. Hopefully, I think it's the second chapter of Second Kings where we see the whirlwind and the chariots and the horses of fire come down. So, in in nineteen, the way it's it's uh, the way it's uh, stated, God's telling Elijah to do it, but Elijah's not going to be the one to do it. So, so we turned there and talked about how still it, it took place, but it took place with Elisha because um, Elijah um, is. Um, I want to say, how can I say, taken up uh, to heaven. Okay. Does that make sense? So Elijah 
is trans. Elijah's given the command or the, the duty, the command, but Elisha, Elisha, Elisha fulfills it, right, fulfills it, it, right. Well, I mean, it still doesn't change my question. Why did the man of God anoint an enemy king? Uh, I, I think that's a good question, and, and my answer might not be, be the best, but God will use um, enemies often as servants. And so... Um, I would think if you if you see how they would they would actually show some respect and almost like Lord and servant and so forth. So I believe that they they knew that both Elijah and Elisha were the men of God. They were afraid. Now when and so I'm going back because I'm 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 looking at passages of scripture to to come up with what I think is a is an uh, a a good answer. Um. Je, so Je, Jezebel and uh, Ahab. When they they understand what took place on Mount Carmel, and they understand that they were defeated. When we go to first, when we go to Second Kings, and we see Ahaziah, he's trying to send these men out. Elijah has these men burn up, so they understand that there's a power of God. If what Josephus is saying is true about Elisha, he feels that God's hand is on him. He's he's scared. He sends a servant with Naaman. He sends now uh, word through Hazael to find out if he's going to recover. I, I I believe they knew so. Even in so, God is a God of all. God is a God of all the nations. He He really didn't have to ask their permission to do it. So I think we just see God showing us as uh, showing us removed and showing even even the Syrians that I I control things. Think about again. Here's here's. Are, are you following me? Here's um Ben Hadad and he sends men out and Elisha pr- prays that they be blind and then they end up in Samaria. And they can't even, I mean, it's like they, they could have been killed right there. And Elijah's like, um, let's feed them. The, what they should have done, it, it, Josephus says some things on that that I, I thought was interesting. Um, they should have seen God's mercy. They could, they could kill us right now, but it's like he determined, well, we still, later on, we're still going to fight. Um, so I, 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 I believe God was giving them opportunities to actually come under the banner of his, of his law, come under the banner of being, you know, like what? Uh, partaking of God's wisdom, so when you when you when you ask that question, it, it might not be the best, but God would use enemies. And I, Tim often says this one, so this one sticks out in my mind a lot too. I think it's in uh, Isaiah ten where the Assyrians are using it. It even talks about them being uh, the servants. So I think a lot of times where it looks like there's going to be an enemy against God, God, God can still use that, but it's not going to thwart what God wants. So. Was your question why or what was the question why did he do it why did a man of god mm-hmm. one, of, one of the prophets of god mm-hmm. anoint a king i guess from a foreign land or from an enemy land i think well the, the main thing i would do is because god told him to because <laughs> god told him to but i but i think that i think part of the answer is that they they knew god's men servant were were powerful they knew that they acted on behalf of god and that when he, when they said something it came to pass so um again that was conjecture when i say i think has might have been concocting an overthrow can i say that overthrow of uh, ben hadad because when he looked at it, it just there's something there and um it, those those verses I, I they they still they want as far as i'm concerned for more explanation but we we, we see that he goes and he kills been had at so god's god of god's god of the nations so i don't know if that's sufficient but there's there's probably someone else who can um um amplify that or tear it down and give another response that's better or what have you but so tell me what you think about what i said i mean well Please. the answer that you gave because god told him to i mean ultimately if god told him to anoint um anoint uh, an enemy king then the man of God is going to be obedient Mm -hmm. Um, I just found it curious really you know because you hear about God's prophets anointing the kings over his chosen Mm -hmm. people but I think this is the first time that I've seen where um the scripture actually says that a prophet of God has anointed a foreign king or an enemy king. I see, 
you know, when we talk about um, the different nations that God used to punish the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't necessarily say that God anointed those kings. So I'll give you a case in point. That. I'll give you a case in point, and it's not exactly the same. When looking at the Pharaoh, you'll see how the scripture will talk about how Pharaoh would keep, he would like change his mind, and then they say, we, let us go. Mm -hmm. We need to go offer sacrifices and so forth. But then I can't remember what chapter it's in. It's if it's in chapter 7 or what have you. Of, I think it's Exodus. It'll say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. But it, God knows what's in the heart of man and what he's going to do. And if that, and he'll, he still gives opportunities for that individual to change. Because I think with the number of plagues that were given, Pharaoh had an opportunity to change. But I want to say it's 7 and 13 of Exodus, or it might be, I, I don't remember. But because I, I remember years ago when I would read that, I would stay on it. I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. But then, I don't know, God, one day he's like, okay, go back and read. And I would see how Pharaoh was going to do something, Pharaoh was going to do something, Pharaoh was going to do something. And it's like, okay, this man is not changing. So you'll see where God said, like, okay, I'm going to let you do it. And in, in that in that case, um, Moses, Moses isn't, uh, how can I say, um, disobedient. But you see that there's there's issues with the people of God because as soon as he, you know, they get across, they start complaining and saying, well, you brought us out here to die. So I don't think all of them were like that. So I, it's, while it's not exactly the same, you see God in the way that, the way the scripture says, it's like, okay, we'll let you do this. I think. God, well, I know God knew what was in Hazael's heart. And then he's like, um, and there could have been some others who were going to do that. But he, it looks like he had enough prominence um, or, or, or cloud influence over the people that somehow I would imagine they had some kind of um, uh, inauguration or what have you to make it official that he's going to be the king, especially if he killed him in secret but we we see what we we see that the scripture is going to bear out even with what we read in chronicles 22 that he's king so i think in look in looking at what god is determined is going to happen this is the one that's going to do it and when when elisha starts crying and weeping with the punishment because if you look at the leviticus it's seven times and then if you don't if you don't repent then this and if you don't repent and if you don't repent it's they already eaten not, not dog's head uh, donkey's head and eating dove's dung. This is like, this is not good. So I, I got to deal with you severely. And I, and I, I think it was in my prayer when I was saying that, uh, so that in, in, in situations as such, man can, uh, see him or herself, a woman can see herself and they can turn to God and repent. So that's, I guess I just think, you know, when you think about, um, the anointing of a king, too. You know, I, I think about well, you think about how Saul was anointed, mm -hmm. and then how David was anointed. I mean, it was like a big deal. It seemed like there ceremonially there was something, um, there was something very special about the process of anointing. So I guess I just have it in my head. You know, why is the man of God going and ceremonially? anointing mm -hmm. an enemy king okay so now i didn't i didn't look at the anointing if it was the same but there's two different nations here and so i i perhaps inferred incorrectly or assumed when we look at how the the kings were to be anointed it would be the oil and, and so forth and that when we look at david and when we look at saul i think in samuel somewhere around the ninth chapter 10th chapter of first samuel with david I think it's the seventh, sixteenth, seventeenth chapter, and then when he's really done, in Second Samuel, somewhere around the third, fourth chapter, when the when all of the nations together, mm -hmm. but not nations, north and south, uh, pretty much wholeheartedly say, okay, David is the king. Mm -hmm. This is Syria, so I I I don't gather that there's the or, the pouring of the oil of what Leviticus says. I think it's in Leviticus somewhere around three or four. Um, at least for the priest, you, you you start seeing some of the things of what that ceremony that you're referring to, I think, means. I in this case, I think it means to officially do it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I could be wrong, but I I don't see him anointing as this is this is a Hebrew mm -hmm. like that. I think I, I'm in, I'm inferring 
that you're you're officially making him that. And so it looks like in in the heart of uh, Hezael, you gave him license. Well, if I'm if I'm going to be the king, you know whether Hezael not Hezael uh, Ben Hadad is recovered or not, I'm killing him. <laughs> you know, so again, I, I I can't say definitively, but I I don't I don't think Tim or Ann or someone else may have read something on that. So um, I'll be quiet so they can speak if they want to. Or you can how you put how you put my my name in your mouth. <laughs> I learned. <laughs> I don't have a problem with him anointing Hazael, and uh, I believe he anointed him. I believe he put oil on him. That's my inference. Okay. And I did say, and I did say inference, but I don't remember no other places. I mean, it may be one where somebody was just anointed with words. But uh, I believe he anointed him, and I believe he was anointed to do a job. His job was to go there and execute God's judgment on those people, and that it was for, and it was from the Lord. I believe that's the same kind of thing Jonah hated. Jonah didn't want God to bless those people over there in Nineveh, because the people in Nineveh would end up being the the ones that carried him into captivity in 722 BC, hmm. uh, and I believe. I believe that's what he was doing, I believe, and I believe that they had brought it upon themselves, and God had already shown them over to all the nations. I just, I'm just, i just in covenant with one. That's I only have one nation I'm in covenant with. But the other thing is, is that, not that I'm finished with that, but I don't want to forget, but you made a mistake tonight that I really liked. Uh, when you start calling Judas Judah, oh. because that's what it is. Our anglicized brothers change their name from Yehuda or Judah to Judas because people that don't read it get confused. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just thought about when Satan enters into praise, then betrayal is all betrayal of the Most High is always there. Mm. Wow. Because Satan entered into Yehudi or <laughs> Judah, which is yeah. which is praise, then there was betrayal. When 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 Satan entered into praise, what you call singing and worship and all of that, look at any time this satanic or anything that's outside of the will of God enters in. Look at what happened when they danced for the Ark of the Covenant. What happened? Look at when the people honor God with their mouth and their lips, but their heart is inclined towards Satan. It's, it's, it's a, it was a really, it was a really beautiful faux pas. How you like my French? <laughs> uh, I like it. See, we, we get, we getting somewhere every now and then I can say one word and maybe I can go buy a Porsche with that much knowledge. But, um, I, I want you to restate what you said though, cause I'm making a note, my little book here. Excuse me, you said when Satan enters into praise, what? Then uh, betrayal is is always going to take place. Betrayal. You see, it happens physically because the man's name is praise. Mm -hmm. But look throughout the scripture, just take your mind and let your cursor go in and just click on some files and open them in your mind and look at all the times when something was supposed to be done to the glory of the most high and somebody else was doing outside of his will and look at what happens every time mm -hmm. it is it, because that's what see god inhabited the praise of his saints so if you got someone else in the praise of his saints guess who's going to be exiting Another thing is the Bible said God raised up Pharaoh for the position that he might show his works in him. So now when he raised up Pharaoh to show his works in him, we also had Pharaoh doing stuff to the children of Israel. Yeah. I would sub I would submit to you that Israel needed this butt whipping. You already said 
You got Jehoshaphat being stupid. You had Ahab ruling and doing things. You got two Jehorams. You got two Hokkaim women. You got Jezebel. You got Athaliah. Athaliah want to rule. She in, she going to mm -hmm. enter into real Judah. That's a nut, that's a satanic thing entering into Judah. I'm talking about now the nation. You got Ahab entering into Judah. You got Jezebel entering her stuff into Judah. And I submit to you that when we get arrogant and we let Satan enter us, we're gonna we're gonna betray the Lord as well. Mm. But him anoint him anointing Hazael was a beautiful thing. Because here's somebody already inclined to do it. And I'm showing you all. I ain't playing. I'm not playing with you. How do you like that, Adrian? That's good. What else? I learned that one, too. What else? <laughs> Tm, can you repeat your answer? I left out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> right now, <laughs> <laughs> Are you talk about to to like Adria's question or, or yeah, or, her okay. question. <laughs> He, give, well, me a, give me a minute and I will. Yeah, well, to 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 not have that space, I'll talk and then he can just pick take take it away. He said that he believed that um, he uh, Elisha did anoint him. He said he didn't see in the scripture where um someone was just anointed with words, so he said it was his inference. And so he felt like that was done. He felt that like, uh, yeah, huh? That he, that, that he ceremoniously did it. Um, so that's what that's what he was saying. And um, yeah. And then he he was saying um, he went into talking about. Let me see. I wrote it down. Well, I, I just he said um, uh, he liked the because I I said I I I, I uh, refer to Satan Satan entering into Judah and I'm I meant Judas and Drew was like Judas and I said Judah and I, and I said well and then it, I think at one point it's like kind of the same kind of sort of but uh he said that Judah uh means praise and he said and when Satan enters into praise there's all then betrayal to God always takes place and so he was he was talking about um how how when Satan entered in, into to Judah, he he basically um, you know, betrayed God, and so when when um, uh, Satan like enters into worship where one is supposed to be showing allegiance to God, obeying God, not taking it back historically with either I say having false gods or adopting the culture and and, and syncretism. He didn't say that, but it, it, I think. He, he he's speaking all of that then there's the betrayal to god and so forth so are you back yet tim so the question was why was he anointed someone in a different nation or just an, or an enemy nation uh, I, well both really oh okay why did he anoint an enemy king or a king of a different nation that wasn't chosen by god Oh, well, it reminds me of what the voice from heaven told Nebuchadnezzar after he declared that he would be cast out and eat grass like oxen. Uh -huh. He said it was it was said that um that was to be done to him until he know that the most high ruled in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he wills. Mm -hmm. So what I'm I'm saying, what Gary is saying is that he uh the most high rules in the kingdom of men and he gives kingdoms to whomever he wills. Okay. That's in um Daniel four. I think it's in chapter four. I'm looking and um I'm reading it uh 
But it, it says something about a voice, so it's got to be around. That's it seems like that's a long chapter. <laughs> yeah, it's got, it's got thirty-seven verses, and I was looking oh, at verse thirty-four. It's toward it's the what? end. It's toward okay. the end. Got to be thirty something. Okay, I'm looking at um thirty-four, but let's see. Is that it? <sighs> I'm, I'll read and you, you'll probably um, no. This is um, 34. It says, at the end of the days of Nebuchadnezzar, lift, wait, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the most high and I praised and honored him uh, that liveth forever. Does this sound close to where you're looking? It sounds, wait a minute. Would you say that's verse what? That's 34. Go up some. Okay. Go up like two. Okay, if it's not in four to be in five, because five, five talks about it too. Okay, let's see. It's in, it's in verse 17. Verse of chapter four? Uh-huh. Okay. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the, and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will, and sets up over the basis of men. Okay. That's not the one, but there's another one in there too. But that's that's better than the one I had. Check out, check, check out chapter 5. Maybe you might find something in chapter 5. Let me look. Um, About 5 and 25 or something like that. I, I could be wrong. It, it's when he when he said that he he said is this it isn't this great Babylon? Oh, that's the, that would probably be chapter four then, because he was talking to Smack. Oh, that's that's around the, that's the, the first part. Yeah, that's the first part. I think. Um, how great are the signs? And blah, 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 blah. okay, here it is. That was verse thirty. Is this not great Babylon that okay. I have built for the house of the kingdom? By the might, by my might and my power, okay. And then it says, it says, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. And then it, it's that same verse on down in the uh, let me see, thirty-two. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as ox, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Mm -hmm. So that that's what Gary, Gary, that's what you were saying pretty much. Mm -hmm. That I just want, I just wanted to find an example of that. I said it sounds like what he told Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Okay. But do, but doesn't in the fifth chapter he Nebuchadnezzar acknowledge the same thing after it happens to him? Yes. Okay. It, it's the same chapter he says it. I know in Jeremiah he tells him I'm a god of the, okay. of the nations too, and in Amos. What happened is I got bothered. Somebody somebody came and bothered me and they kept talking to me and <laughs> and and I didn't want them to say <laughs> words to me. And, uh, yeah, it's at the end of the same chapter. It's, it's verse 34. It says at the end of those days that he blessed the most high. And so, uh, part of them being an enemy, it seems as if they were allies to some extent. Uh, you know, because some nations would you pay other nations to come and help them fight other nations. And yep. So, I mean, we really looking at what happens uh, many times, even mm -hmm. now. Yep. The one king, one like they talk, they saying in Venezuela, they had. <clears throat> I'm not saying none of these people are people of God, but <laughs> they had an election. They elected someone, and now they say they want to put somebody else in his place. So these other nations got together and say, we want to rule. We're going to put somebody else on a throne. We're going to anoint somebody else to be king, to be the president or the prime minister of Venezuela. So you still see these things happening. You still see these people come together 
and make decisions. You still see if if you see a lot of times people go, it used to be that the Pope would put up kings and set down kings, mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of these this and, is and, and, and take over the world and take over the world. <laughs> right. And so we're looking at history. And I think sometimes we don't really see it that way, that the, it's, these things are still happening, that this type of behavior is still happening. Many times we don't see what we call men of God, but we see the same, we see people in his stead or people who say, I have that power or I have... I have the will to rule, therefore I will put up who I want to put up. Mm -hmm. And so many times we read the scriptures and we don't really, we don't see that people still doing this stuff. Nations mm -hmm. are still doing this. They're coming against each other. And I wanted to hear what you had to say about that stare, Gary. I missed it. About about the what? The stare he gave. Oh. Him, intently upon him or something like that. Um, I was, I, I think, well, one of the things I said is I think that there's, it, 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 I would like to know more detail about it. So I, I, I did some inferences there and I was saying that I, I would like, I, I wish I could have, I don't know if I said seen it. I said, it looked like he, the spirit of truth was looking uh, through uh, Elisha at Hazael and okay. it almost, it almost seems like Hazael might have been how can I say told told by God what he was going to do, you oh, know, because okay. he start he he, he looks at it and then he starts to weep and so I I kind of moved it from Hazael to the judgment of God, and seeing that it looks like also to me that uh, Elisha knew that God was going to deal with his people. Yet he it's like um, Hazael was the wicked one, but I think you know how Daniel is weeping and I think it's nine or where wherever it is in um. In, in in Daniel, not Daniel, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is weeping in uh is it Daniel? I'm confused. Jeremiah is a weeping prophet. Right. But <laughs> da Daniel talks da Daniel, Daniel falls out a lot. Ja right. Jeremiah. <laughs> Daniel refers to Jeremiah. Daniel wait okay. A minute. Okay, I'm 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 kinda mixing them. Anyway, Jeremiah is weeping and he's asking, no, it's not. Daniel is read, reading what Jeremiah wrote and he's okay. praying and he's asking God for forgiveness. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. Okay. And it, it looks like uh, to me that um, that um, Elisha realized, OK, God is God is dealing with us. And, and, and it seems like there's that there also instead of just has you're wicked. I, I, so I, I, I think I leaned more. In the explanation with that, then um, I kind of mentioned when Jesus looked at Peter, it's like Jesus knew what Peter was going to do. And it just it almost seems like that. But I I think the judgment and that this is actually going to happen. And this was this was never the way it was supposed to be. I, I kind of I think so uh, think in that, that moment he actually saw it. Like I, I don't know. I don't. Well, he says um, you're going to where he says you're going to rip the, the you're going to dash the children against the wall. You're gonna um, basically not spare the pregnant women. They're very vulnerable. You're gonna you're gonna defeat the, even the strongest of the warriors uh, for for Israel. You're gonna burn the city wall. I I, I feel that um, he's seeing God's judgment and that this is this is such a sad thing. It, it, I guess it reminds me of the mourners, in a sense of even of Ezekiel um, with the ink horn. So yeah, you're wicked and you're going to do that and, and so forth. But I think that there's another part in there where he realizes we've been, we've been wicked and God, you're, you're going to deal with this. And um, so I, I kind of pulled that in there a little bit. Okay. I don't see no problem with him seeing it. He saw Naaman was going to be healed if he bathed. Mm -hmm. He saw what happened with Gehazi. I don't see no problem with him seeing what he's going to do. I believe the man said when he said he saw it, I believe he seen it. Like the old folks say. I was thinking like when it says he fixed his countenance on him and he settled mm -hmm. his countenance on him and looked at him. Mm -hmm. I was thinking he could see it in that moment. And However he yeah. seen it. I don't yeah. that ain't that ain't that Tim's not gonna argue. That's that's above my pay grade. 
<laughs> it's almost but as I believe if like, by... in that moment he saw it and it's like, oh, and yeah. it, and he cried. Well, he went, they didn't say he was crying before he did it, but yeah. you know that that that'll give some ink on on what you're saying, saying. But I'm just telling you. Uh, I ain't walking away. I don't care how much y'all talk. I don't believe y'all got enough power to make me think he didn't see it somewhere in there. I believe, I believe he <laughs> seen true. it. And well, let me I mean, tell you what it reminded me of. Go ahead. When Jesus said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. I thought about that, children. too. I thought about that, too. And it's like, I believe, I, when he, I, he, I believe he seen it. Yeah. And so the point being made is that this this thing is bad. And you got it's got to happen because y'all won't learn. Yeah. You went and made league with these people. You could have been a benefit to them. That's where Abraham comes from. Mm-hmm. Abraham Abraham comes from this area of the world. But instead of you all being a benefit, when you took them and you were able, you should have been able to show them what our God has done in this war. But instead, y'all still up to your stuff. You still doing. So now I, I got to deal with you. I got to deal with you. And so when God got to deal with you, then it's like I'm going to do with you according to what I've already said I'm going to do. And he has said what he would do. You, you alluded to the 26th chapter of Leviticus. He said I'm going to do these things. Right. So to me, So to me, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful, you, cause you, you, cause look at what happened to we black people. Mm-hmm. Somebody been anointed. Somebody got power mm-hmm. over us. Yeah. It's like it ain't just like a God given power. It ain't like they just took a power and they've been able to wield it this long. Mm-hmm. I don't even care if you don't want to say that you know we the people of God. I, I don't even care. Nobody's going to have power over people that long, that hard, that wickedly. Because if you want to say that the Bible is right, they have taken stolen people, did not return the stolen people, steal lands from the people, rape the people, and use his name as if they ain't cognizant of him, and you take his name in his mouth? Oh, no. That, he deals with that. He deals, he said, what, it's 50, it's 50, Psalm 17, to the wicked, and take my covenant in their mouth. I don't know exactly how it goes, but I'll tell you what it means. The wicked need to keep my mouth, I keep my name out of their mouth, because they pervert me. Read it, Andrina, somebody read it, because I don't want it misquoted, 50 and 17, I believe it is. It says. Might be 16. Oh, okay. But unto the wicked, God said, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldst take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my words behind thee. See, so when I start looking past Haziel, and I start looking past, I, I, I don't want to forget Haziel. I don't want to forget what they're doing. That would not be good. That would not be pretty. But when I look past and see the pattern, I, I, I believe that if there had been Elijah, Elisha there and he was anointing Christopher that lumbus and anointing that pope that did the doctrine of discovery, I believe he would have cried. And he said, why are you crying? I see what you and your people are going to do. To my people, you're going to take their children and throw them to alligators, and they're going to be eaten by alligators, and they're going to be killed by alligators, and you're going to rape the women, you're going to ravage the children, you're going to rape the men, you're going to oppress the men, you're going to beat the men, you're going to kill the men, you're going to burn the men, you're going to cut their penises off, you're going to have people scalp them, and then give them $20, $20 a piece for every one they take the scalp off the head and bring the Indians from South Carolina. You're going to do these things. Am I a dog's head? Yes, you're a dog. Yes, yes that's what he said, yes. Yes, you're a dog. <laughs> but I'm anointing you to do this. 
I, this could not go on this long, I believe, without it being the hand of God. I, I don't, I don't, I just, I might be all the way stupid in the heart of, in the minds of people, but how can it go, how can anything like this go on so long uh, if the Lord don't do it? There was some a passage like if something happened in the city if the Lord has not said it. I don't remember it because I'm not teaching right now. But how, how can war come in the city lest the Lord send it? Right. How? How? There have been times in the Bible, somebody said, I'm going to go do such and such. Well, let's use Pharaoh. I'm going to pursue. I'm going to get them. They're going to come back to me, playing a runaway slave. I'm going to bring them back, and I'm going to teach them. I'm going to teach them as well as Gideon in the future will teach those people. I'm going to teach them like Zebab. I'm going to get me some thorns. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to whip them. I'm going to spank them, and I'm going to go back to killing their sons. And they pursued. And Yahweh said, but your time is up. Your time is up. So now what you're pursuing is your own death. you running towards it. You love death. Uh-huh. And now what I'm getting ready now I'm getting ready to keep I'm getting ready to keep my covenant. I'm getting ready to keep my right. promise and I'm getting ready to show the world my pattern. You will reap what you sow. And I'm telling you now, I ain't trying I'm doing it. But I ain't doing it just to say to just talk about black. But if you don't if people don't think America our white brothers in their, in their system of legalities are not going to reap what they sow, then they really don't believe the Bible. Mm-hmm. Nations reap. Nations reap. Nations get judged. But we're going to end up, if we don't get our little act together, we'll be caught up in it. Yeah. So often we take the ways of our oppressors. Yeah. And we say, I don't go subjugate a nation. I don't go. Be, you do your wife. Mm. That's you right. You do your wife. That, that's the nation you have. That that's little right. nation you have right there. You don't have a big one, but you're the same kind of bastard. The same <laughs> kind of bastard. You're the same. And like a, like a, like America calling themselves sons of God, children of God, in covenant with God. You call yourself in covenant with God, and you whipping your wife's butt. She ain't your dog. This ain't the fourth sura. Oh, but you acting like it is, mm-hmm. and so when he anointed Haziel, that ought to scare somebody mm-hmm. because now you get a chance to see that God anoints way more than what you all think. You all think everybody here be righteous. Mm-hmm. But Gary, you made a poignant point. Do you you? <laughs> If you wouldn't have been my brother, I might would have let you be my brother. Oh. <laughs> you know, he was preaching. He was preaching. Yeah. He was preaching, boy. L- l- listen, listen to the living light. Um, I believe that what you did was gave me another piece of ammunition when I deal with my Calvinist brothers that say that everything happens, God decrees it. And it has to be that way. Because I believe with all sincerity, there's only one or two things that I can see that happen. Either the man recovered in that short period of time, or he was going to recover. And yeah. since he saw that he was going to recover, I Kill feel him. And I right. So not that God wasn't going to recover him, but I'm going to stop it from happening. Yes. Because when you, when you brought that up about Keilah, God's will is like this is what's going to happen. It's as if God gave, it's as if God gave Elisha two scenarios. One, yeah, I like he's going to recover. That. Yes. One, you'll be king. I'm crying. I'm because I know which one you're going to take. Yes, of course. He's it's God's so decree. Well. Mm-hmm. It's God's decree that he recovers. It's God's decree that he recovers, but your decree, yes. and it ain't going to be outside of God's purview, because I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. I ain't going to make you do it. You're going to see an opportunity, yes. and you're going to probably lie and say, he just died. And you, you didn't leave a mark on him. 
That's you right. You didn't leave a mark. You wet the towel so the air couldn't go between it. You wet it. Almost what they call waterboarded minutia. You know what you did? <laughs> yeah, minutia. <laughs> yes. You, you wet it. Yeah. And you could come in. Look what happened. Look what happened. He did. Help, 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 help. Yeah. You you got it all pretty. It's yeah. so pretty. No he bars. He chose to be the dog. He chose to be the dog. <laughs> he chose that. And, I, but and see, and Elisha, and Elisha already knew. I already, I see you. I see you. I see he didn't have you. to go through and he didn't have to go through and say you're going to kill him. All I'm going to do is give you enough information, and you're going to believe that thus saith the Lord. Mm. I just he going to recover, but I want that kingdom. Yeah. I want to rule and reign. And so what he did was thwart the will of God. In mm. so far, in so far, listen, as he saw it. Right. Because God has more than one plan. I still believe if he hadn't killed me, it would have came out. But yeah. you went on and did it. And I believe that's the way we thwart the will of God in so far as we can. God tells us certain ways to treat our wives, yeah. our children. He tells us what the home is supposed to be. He tells us what the family is supposed to be. He tells us what to be in our families. He tells us what to be in our parents. And we go do things that thwart his will. Mm -hmm. It ain't ain't the fact that his will won't be carried out. Like I was telling Mama one day, and like I look at our lives, when we're young and we're foolish and we're happy, and we're foolish, and we're stupid, and we're not preparing ourselves for later on in life because we got too much folly, and our parents and things, they sometimes they don't know enough to teach us about how to be prepared. We prepare ourselves to have less to do for our children that we should, that we would have had, because we can't look back over our life and see we didn't waste too much. Right. And then when our parents get older, we see that we don't have what we would have had had we done differently. And mm-hmm. if we're going to go back and blame it on God and we don't go back and what choices did I make? Right. And in the case with this Haziel, you know, I, he, this is what God said he'll recover. I know what God said, but it's in my power to do him hurt. Yeah, and, he, and God didn't stop it. I, this is what I believe. I believe that's the same thing as Keila. Mm-hmm. And I and, and I don't know a Calvinist that can dissuade me from that. That is good. I like the way you phrased it because it was super pretty. Because if you got people right now, that's their whole thrust. On saying no matter how you live, you are always saved because God has already declared it. And when God declared it, it can't change. He said the man was going to recover. There is nothing to tell me that the man went on to recover. Nothing. Nothing. That this man saw him, it might have looked like it, but usually when the Bible says somebody recovered, it lets you see they recovered. They skin mm-hmm. be white. They see men walking like trees. They cry. They see how your eyes get open. Uh, you cook up your bed and you walk. It, it, we don't usually see stuff where it's just it's decreed and, you know, we just say it. It's usually you get to see something. We didn't see a recovery. But I, but that, but Quaidly say knew <laughs> what was said. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what was he knew what was said, and he had respect unto that word. He did. He respected it so much. He went on. Why did he go on and kill him? If he didn't believe the man of God, he could have just let him go on and die. Now I know of a woman whose husband was sick unto death, and she was like, he keeps hanging around, 
and, and but even she didn't kill him as much as she was ready for him. As least far as I know, she didn't kill him. <laughs> as far as I know, she didn't kill him or do anything to exacerbate it. But I don't know, man. Sometimes uh, people feel you good. You good as dead. Uh, Maybe I'll give you a little, a little less food. Uh, Maybe I know you're alert. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doctors in hospitals do it. Yeah. They give you a little less of this or a little more of that. We tired of fooling with you. And why, why, they people, why they get, to, why they get to be so righteous when they as, as hurry up and accelerate your death? Mm. But that's what I, that's what I believe, and I, I don't think, I don't think I'm wrong. I'm not going to apologize for not thinking it either. I believe with all my soul. That rascal knew he was going to live, and he didn't want to be second in command. And evidently, he didn't feel that that man was going to deal with Israel the right way. Okay, so that's what that was my next question. I was going to ask. So, um, did he think Israel was going to deal with him the right? They were going to deal with Israel he, the right way. Well, I was going to say, did he already have that in his heart to dash the children into? And to rip open the women, because he he reacted as if I, I, that never came into my mind. He may have wanted that land, all of that property and the, their resources. Israel had a whole lot of land, and uh, and see that other man might have appreciated they were shown mercy. Right. I don't know. Because sometimes when you show people mercy, then it upsets others. Remember, we were, we were talking about Pharaoh one time, and you were saying one of the ways that God hardened Pharaoh's heart is that he 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 didn't like the fact that God had showed mercy on yeah, Israel, well, and he was jealous. Yeah, he showed him. He showed them favor. And he and that was something he, you know, he wasn't he wasn't up for that or down for that. Either however you <laughs> want to say it. When you say the other man, you're referring to Ben Hadad, right? Yeah, no, no, yeah, Ben hated. Yeah, okay. see, Ben hated may have had a totally different spirit. He did. I mean, if he if he sent him to Elisha and asked see? him, and not sent him to the gods of Syria, whoever they were, and they seems as if they had a relationship some sort of way, and like see? you said, the Hazael didn't like it. Well, it I don't know how long Naaman was in the picture, but it seems. I would just I just imagine that he um um observed was Ben Naaman. Hadad Na was Ben Hadad Naaman's king. I'm 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 think well I know a lot of times I they use that they, I use that same name. Yes. That's right. Because um, Hadad was the god. Right. It's true, yeah. Well even if it but wasn't, the, right. the the history the history is there. Exactly. It is. He knew who to in come. The words of, in the, yeah. In the words of your late uncle, it are. <laughs> or it were. <laughs> you know, he's the one. But yes, the thing is, is that you know, and it may have been too, that he may have felt that the king had let down, been hated. Did you let the door lock? Uh, I can't find my headlight. That's what I'm looking for. You had it. Okay. I, I I was looking for it back there, cause I thought I lost it. We, we put it in that other bag. I I've been outside looking for stuff for about thirty or forty minutes. The Lord has His way of letting me stay in the conversation, don't He? <laughs> <laughs> cause I was, cause see, um, it wouldn't even kept it wouldn't have kept mattering to me, but I paid about fifty dollars for it, and I just wasn't going to give up for nothing. And uh, Uncle Rudy came back, and now I look up, and how did it miraculously get on my seat? 
And I looked up, and there he was, and he, because he normally don't take it. How the Lord works, he must want us to talk about being hey dad together. You know, Tim, you know we were talking earlier this week, a little bit earlier this week. We about, were in love. About, you know, when you meet people, you met, you met a guy, and you talked to him. <laughs> and then I had some things to say about him. You and did. I said, oh, God of Jesus. <laughs> and then I said, sometimes I want to cut to the chain. Like, I, I don't I don't really want to use niceties that I can see something in you. And I really just want to say it. And you so felt that's what, like you felt like he was a field. You felt like he was a field of intestine, didn't you? Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's like Elisha did, did that. Like, I see what's in you, and I'm going to say, let me cut to the chase. Mm. I, I see the wickedness in you. <laughs> this, is, this is what you are capable of. He cut to the chase. And, 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 did, and didn't apologize. Boy. And yeah. didn't apologize for it. And the man said, am I a dog? Uh, yes. Did not <laughs> <say it. laughs> Didn't I just say it? In actuality, by him not answering, I think I want to disagree with Anne. First, I would have agreed, but now I think I want to disagree with her. Not that I just want to, but I'm going to. I think he's, I I really believe he's saying you're worse than a dog. You're a human. Mm. And when you do this, this is worse than a dog. I expect this from a dog. Unless you want to take my word and say this is what he's saying, I expect you to do like a dog. But I, I really believe he felt like he was better than a dog, and I'm thinking you're worse. There's some things you'll do a dog won't do. Mm. Well, he thought that anyway. was probably the worst thing he could say about what he just said. I, I would just, I, I would just be, I would just be a technical with how gravely. I agree, he said yes, but it's even worse than just a yes. You worse than a dog. Mm. Remember one time God was talking about how bad the women were? You all the you all just like the you all just like the you all just like a woman that wanna go have sex with a donkey. God <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Jeremiah. No, that's, 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 that's Ezekiel. That's Ezekiel 23. Now, that's a wild-ass dromedary. I'm talking about Ezekiel when they love the flesh, the penis of God. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. So, so, some, some version obscure it, and they'll say flesh. Mm. And then it'll say the issue, the zera, the seed, the sperm of horses. Mm, okay. In other words, you you are filthy, nasty. One on Proverbs say you got a horse forehead. One time he said you like a whore, and say you ain't done nothing. Just wipe your mouth and keep it moving. <laughs> say that what it said, Ann. Yes. You yeah. think people think God be talking all nice stuff? Will you please serve me? Will you please be my friend? And like. You don't know who he is. And I'm going to tell you something what the wicked do. The wicked know how to talk like God. They'll tell you to shut up, get out, go to prison, go to... They t- the wicked, when they get in power, they talk like how God talks to the wicked, to the righteous. But when the righteous or the so-called church people, they learn, they start playing with the wicked being soft with the wicked, coddling up with the wicked, being friends. Elisha said, you are wicked. You will not be coddling. You ain't going to be like your predecessor. You're going to get rid of everything. You're going to be like Stalin will be in the future, like Lenin will be in the future, like the slave master will to the runaway slave. You're going to be that wicked. Because I could imagine some of the slave masters, or like George Washington or, or Thomas Jefferson, am I a dog's head? If my slave run away, I would kill him. I would castrate him. Am I? Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. You're going to die and leave these people 
to your doggone wife as if she owns them. Like, in your world, she does. And then at the day she dies, they'll be free. And you had thought it out that they knew that the day that she died, they'd be free. And she got scared because it never said how she had to die for it to happen. And she started working to get rid free those slaves. Can you imagine? you 300 slaves, Dre. Gary dies. And leave it in your will for you to own all of them that's, that's yours. But on the day you die, they'll be free. <laughs> Do you think you would eat anything they cook? Do you think you'd want to sleep in the house? Do you think you'd want anything that they brought in from off the field? Knowing that these people work in the field and there are certain kind of plants that are poisonous. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he was smart. Did did you all hear um, about them saying they found what they call a, a, the slave Bible? I did not. I did. It was on. Tell it was on. I think it was on NBC Nightly News, and they say they found a Bible that they found a Bible that they would use during the slave during the time of slavery, mm-hmm. and that they had taken out ninety percent of the Old Testament. And they had taken out maybe twenty percent of the New Testament. That Galatians was completely gone. Um, wow. Yeah. Now, again, every time I see them tell something and say something, you better always wonder why. Why are you telling me this? Mm-hmm. But this is what they say. They found this Bible. I, you all can look it up. And they found it, and I can't, I, I didn't read all of the story, but it talks about all of the passages that were taken out, and there was no exodus. It, they said it took out 90% of the Old Testament. And it's like, would you really need to take that much out yeah. to make people be enslaved? You know what I'm saying? You, uh, unless you at least, actually at least, take it away at least from the history. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. See, yeah. Would you really, if, if I wanted say. to keep you enslaved, I really wouldn't need to take ninety percent of the Old Testament out. <laughs> but if I wanted to keep history from you, and it's your history, then I would do that. Mm-hmm. Because I would be, you would be able to recognize. Because there were some things that yes, there would be some things that it's like I know that that's us. And we practice that. We do that. And so for me to keep telling you this, you're going to remember. I want you to forget. Mm -hmm. But that's what they say. They took out 90% of the Old Testament. And and, and, and like maybe 20% of the New Testament. And they really just kept in a whole lot of the passages that talked about slave, you know, obeying the masters and having to be taken into captivity and taking your punishment and and uh, nothing about, you know, any, nothing about, you know, the, the length of slavery or like it, like it talks about bond or free in the mm-hmm. New Testament, you know, in Christ, we are one, say so they took out all of those things and and that was the Bible they would preach from. That was the Bible that they would allow the uh, the black slaves to preach from. And even with that, they oversaw that too. So, wow. Uh, you all can look it up and get the whole story. But every time I see something that these people say, I have to say, why are you saying this? Why are you telling us this right now? I don't believe you just found it. I don't believe. I, did you fabricate? I don't know. Yeah. But you're reporting it for a reason now. It's news now for a reason. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think the it was repar- on NBC it's probably now. because of the, re- the reparations it. that they're talking about. Uh, a lot of these um, so-called. Um, Democrats are talking about reparations. So if they're putting all that together, they might be trying to, you know, get ready to pull, I guess, some some rationale out, you know, twisting it, not not as, you know, in, in within the right vein, but because they represent so many other things. That that might be a connection. That's true. 
bashful self anyway. Well, just remember, they want us to fight so they can take the rest of our land from us. And it's really the people that own the media that really did the most dirt, but they want all the white people to take all the blame. Yep. You know who owned the media, you know? Yep. So they, they wanted to want determine we would let that go out. Say again? They're the ones that let that story get out because there are a lot of stories they don't let get out. I, right. I, saw, I, I didn't know that a Korean woman or a Chinese woman had killed a young black girl that was picking up a, a thing of orange juice. I don't know if it was in Detroit or whatever. She was killed. She looked like a, a woman that I knew named Marie Madonna Green when I was a kid. And she was killed. And her name was, I think, Latasha or Lawanda or something. They say Tupac used to sing about her in her song, his songs. And I didn't I didn't know that. I did and not you know. And a real woman killed her? Yes, yeah, she was in the store. And the woman thought she was trying to steal some orange juice and it fell on the floor. She picked it up, took it to the counter. And the woman saw her. And then I, I, I show it to you when I get home if you remember the answer. But anyway, the the woman said she thought she was trying to steal and she was frightened for her life and shot the girl in the back of the head and killed her. What? About, about what? 10 years ago. What? Yep, I didn't know that. Well, see, there's a lot of... And I think she got community service and a five thousand dollar penalty. I mean, a five dollars, five thousand dollar fine. All right then. All right then. That's because her intent was really not to kill her. Her intent was really just to stop her. I guess you can stop somebody by shooting them in the back of the head. Yeah, yeah you, really, you really can. That when when your when you, when your powers are like that, you can do it. You can. Wow. But these are these are, these are the things that that are able to. What I'm just saying, I didn't hear about that in the media. That's why I brought it up. And Dr. Greg Bunsen talked about censorship is not only what the person uh, choose to give you, but it's also what they choose to take away and not to let you have access to. Right. So those are the, so those are the kind of things. And God knows if we were to take every criminal case, that's exact. I mean, exactly the same, line upon line, and look at the punishment given to black people versus our white brothers. You might, you really might cry, because I know one white dude. He raped a girl by a trash dumpster. And I think he got community service, and it was so bad that even the white people got together and decided we want to get rid of the judge. Her name was her name was Latasha Harlan. Wow. Okay, her name is Latasha Harlan. In 1991, at the ripe age of 15, Latasha went to a local Korean-owned food store mart and never made it out. The store owner's wife, Soon Jadu mistook her for trying to steal a bottle of orange juice, and a minor struggle ensued. Do grabbed Latasha and ended up getting pushed to the ground. Do then went and got her gun and pointed it at Latasha. Pointed it at Latasha. Latasha bends down and picks up the orange juice and places it on the counter. And Latasha walked away to leave the store. Do shot Latasha in the back of the head at a three foot distance, killing yeah. her immediately. Do tried to claim self defense, but there were two eyewitnesses and the stories you know, and the store security camera showed otherwise. The jury convicted Do and advised the judge to go with the maximum sentence of sixteen years. Do walked away with only four hundred hours of community service, oh. five years probation. Five hundred dollar fine, and the judge says although Miss Do acted inappropriately, her actions were justified. Joy, judge Joyce Carlin states that Miss Do was the victim. Latasha is the criminal and should be standing. Listen, listen. Latasha is the criminal and would be standing in front of her for assault on a store clerk had she not died. The slaughter of Latasha Harlan's 
is one of the major factors in initiating the L.A. riots. We only hear about Rodney King, but she is the original. They put on their hashtag for her name. Tupac had an affinity for Latasha and mentioned her name in several songs, as well as a dedicated, iconic song, Keep Your Head Up to Latasha. And so on this post it says, so today we say, Latasha Harlan, you a pillar, baby girl, whether they realize it or not, as today someone heard your story. And if you look at her picture, she looks like a, just a dark skin Marie Madonna Green from when we were when we were young, Dre. So, so the the so these are the kind of things when I say that censorship, just censorship happens, and when you when you talk about the Bible that they put out, why is it being put out now? I don't know. But I do believe with all sincerity there is a group of people that would love we black people to get out here and fight and to riot again and so that things can happen. And when these things happen, somebody will end up not only being put to death, but lose whatever property they have, whatever rights they have. And with them trying to get rid of the police, we may end up having a situation where now we'll be under military martial law on our side of town. Uh -huh. Not not necessarily everywhere. So we, we really don't know, but usually agendas are always, always doing something. Always. As, 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 as prov not Proverbs, the Psalms say the wicked. Is it Psalms and Proverbs, the wicked, they plot on their bed? They plot on their bed. Mm -hmm. Proverbs, I mean Psalms. Well, I just thought I would uh, buttress what you said, Anne, when you said, why is it coming out now? What, right. what, what's, the, what's, what's the reason? That, that thing might have been found if it wasn't fabricated. It could have been found 30 years ago, uh -huh. 90 years ago. But now we're going to let you all know about it because now the time the time is ripe. You all have the audacity to want to do something about it. Well, you know that the Constitution says if we, we uh, do insurrection against the government, then we go back to being slaves. We lose all rights. Now, but I, I, now that party. what I didn't know. And we, now, can know they no did that the, we can make no claims against the government. Now, I didn't know that when I did know the ones where the so-called Indians, they got all their land taken, taken from them out west because they fought with the Confederates in the Civil War when they were helping, because they had been making money off the slaves, and they had been enslaving uh, the people over here, too. And so what they did was in their in the, when they got the land, it was in their treaty that if they ever made a war against the federal government, right. they would lose those rights. Right. So when they Same fought, thing for black people. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So when they lost, make a make a note, make a notation of that and and send it to the lovely Kim. But uh, after that um, happened, they lost that land. And I have a feeling that Woodrow and his family are the descendants of pe of some of the black people that supposed to have gotten land. They may have gotten it because all the black people out there, when they took the land and put them on reservation, they were supposed to receive those kind of benefits as well. And that's when our white brother signed up with the Dawes Commission and paid five dollars and became five dollar Indians, like Elizabeth Warren. Mm. So a lot of this stuff, when like you say, when stuff come out, it's like, why? What you what what you getting ready to do? There used to be a song, "What you doing doing me with your love?" It was like, "What you doing doing me with this news? Yeah. What you doing? Whoa. What you getting ready to do?" And that's why it's better for us to know the Lord so hard, because if we don't know the Lord so hard, truly, what's going to end up happening is. Not only are we going to be lost, 
We're going to be on the outside of what he wants. And we're not going to get his blessing. My God, how long do you want to live and not have his blessing? Mm. If he don't give us favor, we do we do not win. And well, Kamala well. Harris is not going to help me win, okay? Mm -hmm. she, she is not Hazel. She is not Haziel. <laughs> no, she probably is Haziel. I was just. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well. Gotta be praying. Gotta be praying. Switch onto the light. I said we better. We better be praying. Of course. Right. At at all times. And we and we need to be like the men of Isaacar. They paid attention to the times. Mm -hmm. You know, we grew up in the church where nothing nothing really about the times mattered. Not that much. You know, I thought when all these other churches were doing activism, I mean, our church never even mentioned anything about civil rights and uh, you know, it might not have been the worst thing, but at least they could, we could have been made to know. You're sucking up all my time and energy anyway. 100 hours a week, using hyperbole. <laughs> uh. Well, I'm going I'm to close out, but I have enjoyed the discussion. Yes, I have. Lord willing, we can connect back up again on Thursday night. We appreciate you all calling in. And I say we love you and good night to you all.